Good evening, church. Here are this week's announcements. As our church continues to grow, there will be many opportunities to serve. Are you interested in serving? Please come by the Welcome Center to sign up. If you should have any questions, please see Ray Perfarzik or call him at 678-362-6247. Attention all ladies. The Wings Ladies Spring Banquet will be April 6th at Fort Bluff from 2 to 5 p.m. Tickets are $5 per person and are on sale now. Please see Janae Kaufman to register, pay, and for further information. A Deacon Family Fellowship is planned for family names beginning with C, I, P, and Y on April 14th following the morning service. Please sign up at the Welcome Desk or RSVP your Deacon. If you should have any questions, please see Mike Pullen, John Hawkin, or Herman Fox. Our next men's prayer breakfast will be Saturday, April 20th at 8 a.m. Please come and join us for a hearty breakfast and wonderful fellowship. I want to welcome each one of you to Recobeth Baptist Church. We are truly glad you were with us today. Welcome to Drawing from the Well, the preaching ministry of Recovered Baptist Church with Senior Pastor Alan Stewart. We trust you'll be blessed and find faith, hope, and comfort as we draw from the principles and promises of the Word of God together. Well, God bless you. We welcome you to our Wednesday evening service, and we're going to begin this service tonight with a baptism. And it's glorious to begin services this way, and we've been doing it a lot often, and I hope and pray that we continue to do this. Very first one here tonight, it is Ethan Reevely, and he's going to come.
Ethan, upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, in obedience to His command, I baptize you now, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, buried with Him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. This is Taylor Cordell. Taylor, upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in obedience to His command, I baptize you now, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, buried with Him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. This is Kayla Harvey, who's made a profession of faith in Christ and wants to follow in believers' baptism. So, Kayla, upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in obedience to His command, I baptize you now, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, buried with Him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. This is Judy Ricks, who has made a public profession of Christ as her Lord and Savior. And so, Judy, upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, in obedience to His command, I baptize you now, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, buried with Him in baptism, <laughs> raised to walk in newness of life. <laughs> And this is Howard Buzz Riggs. Buzz, upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in obedience to His command, I baptize you now, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, buried with Him in baptism, and raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Again, what a great way to begin our service, and I pray that the Lord will continue to send us more and more and more that we'll just keep water in the baptistry full time. We always begin our Wednesday night service in a time and season of prayer, and so we're going to join right now with one another in prayer. Ten items, one minute on each thing, and then Patrick's going to come and he'll open us up in worship. Let's be praying.
Well, good evening as we stand together. Let's sing. In moments like these, let's sing, I love you, Lord. In moments like these, I sing out a song. I sing out a love song. To Jesus in moments like this, I lift up my hands, I lift up my hands to the Lord, singing out. seated. As you're being seated, I want to welcome you again to our service tonight. Thank you for coming. God's doing some very unique things in our midst here at this church, and one day we're going to look back, and we're going to be able to trace some things that we might even be missing right here live and in the moment. God is good. God is incredibly good, and He's good all the time, like the song says. And God has been so wonderful to this church. And may God continue to pour out His blessings on Rokoboth Baptist Church. Would you join me as I open up in a word of prayer? Father, we just thank You for the goodness and mercy, the grace that comes from Your hand and Your heart to us moment by moment, day by day. And Father, we just look now in these days at the work that You're doing in our midst And Father, we cannot explain it, and that's good, because all that we know to say is, it was the hand of God. And I pray that we would always say that and always see that, because anything that can be done by our hands, Father, it's not going to last very long. But those things that you do, they, they are eternal. And so, Father, continue to move in our midst. May you draw people to this place, and may you help us to be a people that will always lift up Jesus Christ and make much of Him because He made the Word, the promise, that if I be lifted up, I would draw all men to myself. Father, we come to You tonight asking You to fill the place with Your presence. Speak to us out of the Word of God. Give all of us that have come, those that are listening somewhere else on live stream, God, may there be something out of this message tonight that every person will take away, that their life will be stronger and their walk with You for having heard this message tonight. I ask it all in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Let's stand once more. Scripture reference, Philippians 3, 7, but everything that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. For me it was in the garden, he prayed not my will but He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine. How 
marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows, He made them His very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with a ransom in glory, His face I at last shall see. Will be my joy through the ages to sing of His love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior love for me. And all of God's people said, Amen. Please be seated. All right, if you've got your Bibles, would you take them tonight and find the book of John, John chapter number 11. John chapter 11, and I want for the next few Wednesday nights, I want to do a little study on I am, the I am's of Jesus. He made some very powerful, incredible statements that I want us to look into. And with us coming right off of Easter, I want to start with this one here tonight. Again, John chapter number 11, let's begin reading in verse 20. Then Martha, as soon as she had heard that Jesus was coming, went and met Him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if You had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever You ask of God, God will give You. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Author and publishing executive Joseph Bailey was once flying from Chicago to Los Angeles, and he engaged the woman who was sitting in the seat next to him in a conversation. He asked the woman, Where are you from? She said to him, I am from Palm Springs. 
Knowing that Palm Springs is a city where many rich and famous people are, he asked the question then, what is Palm Springs like? Here was her answer. Palm Springs is a beautiful place that is filled with unhappy people. Taking advantage of the moment, he then asked her, are you unhappy? She said, yes, I most certainly am. He then pressed her as to why she was unhappy, and here was her reply. I can sum it up in one word, mortality. Until I was 40, I had perfect eyesight. Ever since the time I learned that not only are my eyes wearing out, but I'm wearing out. Someday I'm going to die, and I haven't been happy ever since I realized this news. Many people live with such a fear, and it becomes an actual bondage to them. In fact, the writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews 2 and verse 15 that those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Listen, this subject of death is not our favorite subject by any stretch of the imagination. We are all aware, however, that it is a prevalent enough issue in our world to make it the ultimate fear to so many people. You'll find, though, throughout the Bible, many of the followers of God seem to have this triumphant spirit in the way in which they face this subject of death. They lived with hope and the focus on a resurrection and life. Jesus said in John 6 and verse 40, This is the will of Him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him may have everlasting life, and I will raise Him up at the last day. With that thought in your mind, I'm going to speak to you on this subject tonight, resurrection hope. You know the story. In this passage, Jesus has intentionally delayed coming to the aid of a friend that the Bible tells us was sick unto death. And sure enough, Lazarus died. When Jesus finally arrived, Mary and Martha began to scold him. Lord, if you had been here, this would have never happened. You disappointed us. You didn't show up in time, and Jesus, our brother, has died. It is into that setting, then, that Jesus declares, I am the resurrection and the life. I want you to notice how personal this statement is. Jesus doesn't say, I bring resurrection and life, but rather, I am the resurrection and the life. In the presence of Jesus, this tells us death is no longer death. It is something else entirely. As Paul would say later on in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 55, the New Testament, that death has lost its sting. The grave has lost its victory. Now, how can this be? The answer seems to be that death has been transformed by Jesus Himself. I remind you that our Lord often used this word sleep to describe death. When he saw Jairus' daughter, he said in Mark 5 and verse 39, the child is not dead, but sleeping. And in verse 11 of this chapter, when he tells his disciples, Lazarus is just asleep. They were relieved of this news because they knew that meant he was going to eventually wake up. I mean, you think about this tonight. Sleep is natural, and it's normal. That's why none of us ever calls the EMT when you lie down to take a nap. Now, if someone in your house may snore when they do this, you might want to call the cops for noise control. This is a public service announcement tonight. But when we go to sleep again, we know we're going to wake up later. That's why the Bible, especially the New Testament, tells us death for the believer is simply like lying down for a good long nap. In fact, the body may nap for a long time, for years in fact, but in the end, we know that it's going to wake up. Now, why did Jesus raise Lazarus? It's a good question. He did so so that you and I would know that He could do it. Now, let me tell you why that's important. Because anyone could stand and say, I am the resurrection and the life. Anybody could say that. But only Jesus could do what Jesus did. Again, this is very personal to Jesus. And listen, the answer to death is not a resurrection. 
The answer to death is Jesus Himself. Again, He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Once Jesus says that, then He poses a question that sometimes we can overlook as we read this narrative of the story. But it's a key to everything Jesus says here. In verse 26, He says, Do you believe this? And that is the question I want to put in your heart and mind tonight as I jump into the body of the message. Do you believe this, that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? I want you to notice four very simple things. First of all, life is received, beginning in verse 21. He says, Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. I want you to ponder this for just a moment. There were a lot of things that were right about Lazarus. I mean, he followed Jesus. He was faithful to Jesus. Man, he served God. There's a lot of things that were right about Lazarus, but there is one thing that's wrong with him. He's dead. I mean, it didn't make any difference at all how well they dressed him how much money he had in the bank, how many friends that he might have had. He had no life. And the same can be said of so many people that are around us every day in this world. They are just simply existing, drawing their breath and drawing their salary, fighting to live while they live to fight, but they don't have real life. Again, you'll find all around you, there are those people who have a heart that is thumping, whose blood is circulating, whose mind is thinking, but they have no life. Do you remember what Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 6? She who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. That's interesting. The Bible tells us Jesus raised three people from the dead, and there's an interesting connection to all three of them. We're told, first of all, that he raised Jairus' daughter, a little girl who had died, the only daughter of this father. And then he goes into the city of Nain, and there is a widow whose son has died, and it is her only son. Jesus raises him from the dead. And now here in this story, there's Lazarus, who is the only brother of Mary and Martha. Hope you're getting the picture of what Jesus is setting up here, being the only begotten Son of God Himself. Now, here's a good question to ponder as you think these different scenarios of people that Jesus raised from the dead. Here's the question. How do you raise a dead man. (laughs) Well, all the social engineers of our world today, they've got a lot of different philosophies about how we can raise dead men. They would tell us, first of all, just simply give him an example. Now, let's just say tonight and pretend in your imagination that we had a body that was lifeless up here on the stage. You may say, Pastor, we've got someone on the stage that's brainless on the pulpit in the stage tonight. But listen, a life that has no life. And then what we could do is I could go over to Brother Patrick, and I could have Brother Patrick come and give him an example. Patrick can go over and show him how a living man really lives. Patrick could do 50 push-ups. I hope you could do 50 push-ups. He could show the man all the strength and energy that he has in his body. Let me ask you, do you think that example is going to be enough to raise a dead man? Of course not. We all know that. But yet, so many people in our society think that all a person needs is a better example. Listen, I like examples. Examples are good, but they don't raise the dead. Can I get a witness? Then the social engineers would tell us, well, why don't you just give him some encouragement? And I could go again if we've got this body up here, and I can go get Brother Marty back here. Marty is an incredible encourager. encourages me every single week. And I can say, Brother Marty, why don't you come on up here and just give this body a little word of encouragement? Marty might come up here and he might say, come on, buddy, you can do it. Just get up from there. Come on now. Just snap out of it. Add up, boy, you can do this. Listen, we've got all these philosophers today who say you can do anything you want as long as you just simply apply yourself to it. Well, listen, a dead man can't. 
He can't apply himself. And so you can encourage him all that you like. He's not going to move. Then they'll tell us, why don't we just give him a new environment? Ah, let's take a dead man and put him in a room full of living people. I mean, maybe if you put him in a room in a good, right environment, that'll give him some life. Let me tell you something. You can take a dead man out of a cemetery and put him into a party, and he is still nothing but a dead man. Now, I think we ought to do everything we can to help people have good environment. But I want you to listen to me. Adam and Eve got in trouble in a perfect environment. You're not going to get any better than the Garden of Eden, and they failed in their environment. Then they would tell us, well, some, why don't we just give them some education? Ah, now, I could go get Brother Terry. And I could get Brother Terry to go find us a medical book, because I don't know anything about medicine and stuff. And Terry probably don't either, but he could read it. And he could understand it probably a little better than I do. And he comes and he tries to educate that body that's on this stage. Terry might even be able to give him 20 lessons on life. You know, there are some people who think the answer to this world's problems are education. Do you remember what Paul told Timothy was one of the signs of the last days in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 7? He says that they are always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So again, back to the question, how do you raise a dead man? Here's the answer. What a dead man needs more than anything else is a miracle. (laughs) That's what he needs. So Jesus shows up and simply speaks a word, and Lazarus receives life. It's worth remembering that all of us, as as live as we are here in this room tonight, there was a time when the Bible says we were dead in the trespasses of sin. Listen to what Paul said in Ephesians 2 in verse 1. And you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses of sin. Now, how do you raise a dead man spiritually? You do it the same way Jesus did here, by his word. John 6 in verse 63, Jesus said, It is the spirit of his life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. Now, when you read through chapter 11, there is a refrain that you see over and over and over, and it goes like this, believe, 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 believe. Jesus says it over and over again. He just keeps saying it, and it's a reminder that real life comes when we exercise faith in Jesus Christ. John told us in chapter 20 and verse 31, these, these what? These stories, these events that we've recorded are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. First and foremost, life is received. Secondly, I want you to see life is released. Notice again here in this passage of Scripture in verse 40. Three in the chapter. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who died came out bound, hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Now, not only did Jesus want to raise him and give him life, but Jesus wanted to loose him. I want you to imagine this scene. Jesus says, roll away the stone. Mary and Martha are aghast, and they say, but Lord, don't you know that it's been four days? His body is begun to decompose. Jesus, you can't do this. Jesus says, roll away the stone. I imagine in this moment that every eye was riveted on that dark, gaping hole. Then Jesus speaks these majestic words, Lazarus, come forth. Every eye is peering there into the darkness. Then a white form appears, and a mummy-like form comes out of that tomb. In Bible times, they tell us before they buried someone, they would wrap them round and round like a cocoon. 
Their legs are bound together. Their arms are strapped down to their side like a straight jacket. Jesus looks at this man who has life and says, but he don't really have liberty. He had been raised, but he hadn't been released. He couldn't work. He couldn't witness. He couldn't praise. He's all wrapped up. And so Jesus says, loose him and let him go. Now again, Lazarus at this stage is like so many people that I know. They've been saved, but they're not living in victory. They've been to Calvary for pardon, but they've not yet went to Pentecost for power. They have life, but they don't have liberty. Because you see, when you get saved, you still have on grave clothes. Those old relics from the past of your life. We're given a picture of this idea in James 1 and verse 21. Lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. The New American Standard has it this way, ridding yourselves of all filthiness and all that remains in wickedness. Now, let me tell you what he's saying. I'm going to illustrate it for you. On the back of my house, just off of our deck, I've got a tree that during the winter, like all trees, all the leaves died. But on two of the lower limbs of this tree, those leaves never fell off all winter long. They still hung on, staying on through the winter, and all the way into last week. Then when warm weather hit, it released the spring-like juices of life into those limbs. And guess what happened? New life pushed off all the old dead leaves. You see, the same thing happens when you and I get saved. When you and I get saved, we come out of the tomb with grave clothes on of the old life. How many of you found out that when you came forward, made a public profession, or wherever you did it, that all those old things did not go away immediately? I mean, you still had some old loves, some old lust. Maybe even some old language. That's why Paul compares our conduct to clothing. When he writes in Ephesians 4 and verse 22, he says, Put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust. Now, here's where some people struggle. They begin to think in their mind that maybe they're really not saved because there's some old habit of the past that just keeps lingering around. But what they don't know is they've still got some grave clothes on that they haven't been released from yet. And like the illustration of the limbs and the leaves and the life that comes through, once the spiritual life of Jesus begins to flow through you, you begin to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, then the new life of Christ, it pushes off. It takes off like a shirt, the old deadness, and gives us new life. I want you to listen to it in Colossians 3, beginning in verse 5. Therefore put to death your members which are on earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Now listen. In which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all of these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Again there, notice the imagery of putting off, taking off the idea of clothing. You see, these old habits, these old grave clothes that are reeking with death and corruption are still wrapped around you even when you first get saved. Let me tell you what the ministry of a church ought to be. Any church that's growing and doing what it ought to be doing for the glory of God, two things ought to be said about that church. Number one, they are calling forth the dead. Man, they're giving life and introducing them to Christ. But then number two, that we take the time to unwrap the saints. <laughs> There's a lot of folk that come to our church that just simply have never been unwrapped. 
You see, the life that Jesus wants to give you is not only resurrection life, He wants to give you released life. That's why we're told in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 17, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Third thing I want you to see, life is refreshed. Look over in chapter 12. The story continues. Lazarus, who's been dead, has been raised from the dead. Verse 2, there in Bethany they made him a supper. Martha served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. I want you to see this. They're having this banquet, and Jesus is there. The Bible points out with great enlightenment of detail, Lazarus was sitting at the table with Jesus. Don't miss this. It's a simple thought. Lazarus had gone from the tomb to the table. He is sitting there at the table, no more grave clothes. Just a little while ago, he was dead and needed life. Jesus gave him life. Then he was bound and needed freedom. Jesus gave him liberty. Thank God after this freedom comes fellowship to sit at the table with the Lord Jesus. Now, what is this illustrative of? Friend, the most intimate fellowship is to sit at a table and eat a meal intimately with someone. And what John is trying to paint a picture here for us is this. He's telling us Jesus desires the most intimate fellowship with you and with me. Can you imagine the fellowship there must have been at that table at that day? Now, here's the best news. You don't have to wait till you get to heaven to have this kind of fellowship with Jesus. I want you to listen to what he said in Revelation 3 and verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. In other words, I'll come in as the guest and then I'm going to become the host. You see, when you come to the Lord Jesus, he bids you to come to have fellowship with him. Have you ever noticed in the Bible how often Jesus is inviting his disciples to come and eat with him? Some of the sweetest times Jesus shared with his disciples were over a meal at the table. After the resurrection, he met them on the shore of Galilee, and he said, John 21 and verse 12, come and eat. Now, here's what I know, though, with this audience. Sometimes we as Baptists have been accused of putting too much emphasis on eating and feast. Can I throw this thought out to you tonight? Maybe we don't put enough. Because you see, it's our legacy to fellowship with one another and with Jesus Christ. You may recall in the Old Testament, Elijah was weakened, running for his life. He had not ate in days. An angel came and fed him and refreshed him. And in the same way, there are places in life where you and I are just tired. We are worn out. We are exhausted from the burdens of life. And you know what Jesus does? He comes and he feeds our soul. And when he feeds our soul, he refreshes us at his table. Didn't Jesus say in John 10 and verse 10, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. You know what he's saying there? I want to add years to your life and life to your years. That's the fullness of life that Jesus gives. And you see, when I stand here and invite people in the invitation to come to Christ, Do you realize I'm not inviting them to come to a funeral? I'm inviting them to come to a feast. Jesus refreshes our soul. Last thing I want you to see tonight, and that is the fact that life is reassured. Notice here in verse number 40. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. 
How do you view Jesus? I want you to know it really matters how you answer this question. Do you remember a time when Jesus was in conversation with his disciples and he asked them a question? He says, who do men say that I am? And they began to tell him all these different things and people that they said Jesus might have been. But then Jesus makes this question personal. Listen to it in Mark 8 and verse 29. But who do you say that I am? There are some people today would tell you Jesus is just a biblical character. Maybe he's some figure out of history. Others claim he was a good man, or perhaps at best, he was a prophet. But if Jesus isn't who he said that he is, the resurrection and the life, if he is not that, then we lose all confidence and assurance in all of our life. I want you to think with me about three things here that make Jesus personal to every one of us. First of all, Jesus loves us in our sorrows, beginning in verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. Many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. And here's what John is really trying to emphasize when he tells us he had been dead for four days. In Jewish tradition, they believed that when a person died, their spirit hung around for three days. On the fourth day, then, if it didn't come back, they were really gone. What John's trying to emphasize is Lazarus was not sick and he was not unconscious. Lazarus was dead. Friends had come to offer their condolences. The air is thick with sadness. It's into this atmosphere that Jesus arrives. Isn't that just like Jesus? In our moments of sorrow and sadness, the resurrection and the life comes to us. The Bible assures us of this in Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. Now, why is this so? He's a sympathizing Savior. You know, many of you know this. The Bible tells us in Romans 12, verse 15, that we are to weep with them who weep. Jesus epitomizes that verse. Do you know that we're told in the Bible three times when Jesus wept? One time as He was coming in on His triumphant entry, He pauses and looks over the city of Jerusalem, and the Bible says that Jesus wept. He saw them like sheep that did not have a shepherd. Then we're told a second time in Hebrews 5 and verse 7, in the days of his flesh when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. Now here in this text, in verse 35, the shortest verse in all the Bible, Jesus wept. Jesus loves us in our sorrows. No wonder Isaiah would say in chapter 53, in verse 3 of him, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Jesus knows what it's like to be sad. And that's why he shows up in our sorrows. Secondly, Jesus listens to our frustrations. Notice here again, verses 20 and 21. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Look at verse 32 then. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, She fell down at his feet saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus listens to our frustrations. This story here is filled with so much humanity that it's hard not to want to read it over and over and over again. I mean, is there anyone here tonight that can relate to where Mary and Martha were? Anyone ever been in that place where you were just saying it, Lord, You disappointed me. Lord, you were late. 
Where have you been? Anybody here ever felt like this? Lord, where were you when my mother took her last breath? Lord, where were you when my marriage fell apart? Lord, where were you when I was abandoned as a child? Lord, where were you when I was overlooked for this promotion I worked so hard to get? I want you to listen to me. These are real heartfelt questions, but they are questions Jesus is not afraid to answer. Are you with me? You ever heard somebody say, Pastor, you're never supposed to question God and ask why? That's not Bible. Those who had intimate relations with God, they ask why. David asked why. Moses asked why. And then the classic example, on the cross, the very Son of God said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is not afraid to answer these questions. After all, He is the resurrection and the life. I want you to understand this. If He can handle the grave, He can handle your frustrations in life. 1 Peter 5 verse 7 tells us, Casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. Listen to this. That includes our burdens, our griefs, our questions, and our frustrations. Have you ever noticed how many of the Old Testament prayers were often lamentations and complaints? David complained an awful lot to God in the Psalms. And I believe it was in Psalm 13, over and over again, he says, How long, O Lord? How long? How long are you going to wait, God? How long? Let me give you a couple of others. Psalm 55 and verse 2, he says, Attend to me and hear me. I am restless in my complaint. Psalm 142 and verse 2, I pour out my complaint before him. I declare before him my trouble. These verses are treasures of reminder that if we've got a real loving relationship with God, we can come pour out our honest heart to Him. Let me tell you, when you come and question and you don't understand in life, God's going to let you know you're not the very first one to ever come to me like this. God can take it. Last thing. Jesus lifts us out of our despair. Verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. I get this. Martha is still holding on to her faith. She knows there's going to be a resurrection out there somewhere in the future. But what Jesus is saying to her is, I, who am standing right here, eye to eye, face to face with you, right now, right in this moment, I am the resurrection and the life. She was overlooking who Jesus really was. Don't miss this tonight. Jesus was not promising that he was going to go around and just start resurrecting people because our hearts were broken. He says with a word of hope, I am the resurrection. He clarifies it in verse 25. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. D.L. Moody said this. Someday you will read in the papers that D.L. Moody of East Northfield is dead. Don't you believe a word of it. At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am right now. You see, Jesus lifts us above the despair of death with the hope that while our physical bodies may die, spiritually, here's what happens. We just move from one place to the other, and we just keep right on moving. Then one day, our spirit is going to be reunited with this old body. And we're going to go be with Jesus and be given a new resurrected body, and we will be with Him forever. Paul gives us this hope in this word in 1 Thessalonians 4. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, 
and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now listen to this. Therefore comfort one another with these words. I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus lifts us out of the despair because there's hope beyond the grave. Again, the question, do you believe this? Let me close with this tonight. Several years ago in the 80s, Vice President George Bush represented the United States at the funeral of the former Soviet leader, Leonid Brezhnev. Bush was deeply moved by a silent protest carried out by Brezhnev's widow. She stood motionless by the coffin until seconds before it was closed. Then, just as the soldiers touched the lid, his wife performed an act of great courage and hope. She reached down and made the sign of the cross on her husband's chest. There in the center of secular atheistic power, the wife of the man who had run it all was hoping and praying that her husband was wrong. She was hoping that there was another life and that life was best represented by Jesus who died on the cross, but that that same Jesus might have mercy on her husband. Again, Jesus tells us very clearly and plainly, not that I bring resurrection and life, but I am resurrection and the life. He is our hope, and He is our future. Heads bowed and eyes closed, they come with a song of invitation tonight. In a moment, we're going to stand and sing. don't know what God may have said to any person at any point in the message, but I pray there was something, something that was an encouragement. Maybe your heart has just been reeling with sorrow. And maybe tonight He's just given you what you need with comfort and hope. Our altar's open. I invite you to come tonight. I just want you to know you can bring it all to Jesus. Bring Him burdens, your sorrows. Bring Him your frustrations. He can handle it. Holy Spirit of God, it's my prayer in this invitation that you would find us all right where we are in life. Meet our needs in this moment. May your grace touch every heart. Give us all what we need tonight, and I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand to our feet and sing, get our altars open. Would you come tonight? All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus I surrender make me savior holy thine let me feel thy holy spirit truly know that thou art mine i surrender all I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all.
God bless you. Before we dismiss our service tonight, I've got another presentation to make to our church family. This is Bob Leonard. Bob, I'm going to ask you to come stand here beside me. Bob was the site manager at Sequoia when I worked out there with Bechtel, and he was my main boss. And now he's going to let me be his pastor. And so I hope that I can do that and do it well. But Bob and Jane, his wife, physically could not be here tonight, but he is going to stand in for her. They want to unite with our church. Coming from a church of light faith, what is the desire of our church? Motion is made. Do I hear a second? All in favor, would you say praise the Lord tonight? And I want to say to Bob, as I say to all who come, tonight it's an honor and a privilege to be your shepherd and pastor. And I'm so glad God's give you peace in your heart to know this is the place where he wants you to serve. We as a church open our arms and we receive you and Jane into our church. And tonight the honor and privilege to be your pastor is mine. I want to be that in every way that I can. So any way that I can ever be a shepherd and pastor, please call me day or night. Everybody knows what protocol is. Bob's probably seen it too. But we don't come around, hug necks, and shake hands right now. But give him a warm hillbilly, soddy daisy welcome into our church. And Bob, you can be seated on the front row. And our membership coordinator will get with you immediately following the service and get your information. Listen, God's doing some strange work in our midst, and I'm just so thankful to be able to have the privilege to see God do the things that we're seeing. May we not get in His way. Just let Jesus be Jesus. Amen. God bless you, Patrick. I'm going to let you close us out, my brother. There's victory in Jesus. Let's sing it together. Oh, victory. Jesus, my Savior forever, He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew Him, and all my love is due Him. He plunged me to Have a great evening. We'll see you back on Sunday morning.